Hello, everyone, and welcome to our new live webcast, Protecting and Licensing.NET Applications. Thank you for joining this new masterclass. With each episode, we provide new highlights, technical tips, and success stories that will leave you inspired and ready to get your protection, licensing, and security techniques another step closer to perfection. At Vibu Systems, we empower software publishers and intelligent device manufacturers with cutting-edge technologies, new business models, and tailor-made consulting training. Let us help you upgrade, optimize, and automate your entire license lifecycle management so you can focus on monetizing your business at a higher level. My name is Daniela Previtali, Global Marketing Director of Vibu Systems, and I'm delighted to have you here with us today. We are joined by Rudiger Kugler, VP Sales and Security Expert, and Axel Engelmann, Architect Protection Technologies, both from the headquarters of Vibu Systems. .NET is indeed one of the top leading choices for global software publishers. However, protecting and licensing .NET applications requires different skills and tools from regular methods applied to C and C++. The intermediate code that is generated remains accessible for snooping and tampering by would-be hackers, and license checks could thus be removed or replaced by forge calls. Code Meter Protection Suite comes with a dedicated AX Protector .NET module that does the heavy lifting for you. Some housekeeping we need to take care of before we start. For everyone who's joining us today, I want to remind you that we will be reserving some time at the end of the session for Q&A, and I'd like to invite you to submit any question you have in the live chat box. This session is being recorded and a link to the replay will be posted directly to you in the next couple of days. And don't forget, stay with us throughout the live session for your chance to win four hours of free Codemeter consultation from the most brilliant minds at our company. At the end of the webinar, a new tab in your browser with three simple quiz questions will show up. You should submit one or multiple choices for each multiple answer question. We will draw the winner from among those who reply correctly and notify them at the time of the replay announcement. Please also note that the winner is excluded from all subsequent prize draws of 2023. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Rudiger. The floor is yours. Good morning, good evening, hello everywhere. My name is Rudiger Kügler and together with my colleague Axel, we will show you how to protect and license uh, .NET applications in the next uh, 50 to 60 minutes. Before we start how to do this with our code manager protection suite, uh, I have a question for Axel. Why do we need a protection for .NET applications? I compile my application, I deliver my compiled application and no one gets my source code. So why should I use something like code manager protection suite? This is a good question, Rüdiger, but first of all, hello also from my side and good to have you here. So let's answer this question by first make you a little bit um, yeah, visible what is actually in the assembly you provide to your customers. And there's lots of information contained in the compiled assembly which exposes IP you researched a lot of time and also has lots of information which makes it for an attacker easy to pinpoint all the critical points in your application and so on. So it's important that you don't get your software analyzed by a tool like Just Decompile, which is a .NET decompiler. And here you see a function called Calculate Pi is visible inside a random assembly. And here you could guess that this yeah, function obviously, obviously does something with uh, circles. And you also see lots of variable names. In fact, it's even like the source code in your IDE we have written before. So for an attacker, it's really easy to get to know what you have done in your software. And if we imagine that you have the Coca-Cola formula in your product, you don't want it to have exposed to others. And I mentioned that Just Decompile is a .NET decompiler, but so there are other tools on the internet like .peak or ILDESN and DNSpy, which offer the same and even more functionality. So it's really good to have something against these tools. And 
Rodrigo, may you tell us something about how we achieve this? Um, yes, so what we offer is Code Meta Protection Suite. And we offer Code Meta Protection Suite for different platforms, for different uh, programming languages. And so we're offering an AX protector for Windows, for native Windows 32 and 64 bit uh, applications, AX protector for, for Mac OS, uh, for the old legacy Intel uh, uh, processor, but also for the M1, for the ARM based, uh, ARM -based uh, technology, technology architecture. We're offering an AX protector for Linux applications. Today we will speak mainly about the AXProtector.net, um, which we offer for .NET assemblies. We also have uh, the same technology for Python, JavaScript, Java, and for, for Android. And let's take a short look on the, on the features. Um, automatic protection means um, you don't think about copy protection licensing during development. You just create your application, executable, exe file. And then when you're finished, you take the exe file, you automatically encrypt, protect it using axprotector.net, and that's it. And then if the license is there, the software starts. If the license is not there, software does not start. License is protected against reverse engineering. License is uh, protected against uh, piracy. And so an automatic stuff, which of course uh, reaches a already basic level of protection. The second thing, modular licensing has two different aspects. Um, one thing is um, you can cut your software into multiple pieces and uh, decrypt them on demand. And this decryption on demand is something that we do with the axprotector.net automatically. So there's no strict border between the automatic protection and the modular protection because the axprotector.net does not encrypt the application as a whole block. It just uh, encrypts and decrypts uh, the, every single function. And so it's already a kind of modular uh, uh, licensing. But I said there's also a second part of modular licensing, which is um, when you want to um, license different features. So one sample that we will show later is a freemium software so that we say, hey, the software should run. It should run without a license, but uh, there are additional features like change font, like hex view, like C sharp uh, syntax highlighting and something like this. And in, in this case, um, we say, uh, okay, we want to protect the functionality for the change front with one uh, license, one firm code, product code. We want to protect the um, hex view with another product code and the C hash with, with another uh, product code. And so this is what we mean with modular licensing. IP protection, also already the automatic protection and modular licensing, of course, uh, offer IP protection. IP protection means more like uh, protecting a software without needing a group meter license. So a better word would have been license free, group meter free. So you encrypt your application and the application does not need a license. It simply starts. So the decryption information is embedded in the software, which of course has some limitations, but of course it's uh, a very good, good solution, but has some, some limitations as mentioned. Um, code moving, meaning moving the code from the application to the dongle or to a CM cloud container, executing it there in a secure environment. That's why it's not available for the CM Act license, for the soft licensing. It's only available for the secure hardware and the secure uh, cloud container. And then executing your code inside our hardware or our computers in the cloud and returning you the output of this operation. And so a hacker could not guess uh, how the function is working. And so um, the challenge here is not to do it technically. The challenge is more or less to find the fitting function. If it is um, too trivial, it might be guessable. If it is too big, it might um, not uh, be um, or might have some uh, performance issues and some spacing issues. I think there's a limitation on the code moving part. Yeah, it's around three kilobyte, so it cannot uh, take more than this, but you can share it between code and data. And uh, if you take a look at the, the sample that we just saw before with the calculate pi, um, I think the calculation of this function is something which could fit into the three kilobyte. So this could be a very good example for a good uh, code moving function. Of course, we need to check if the performance is okay because the calculation power in the dongle, of course, is less than the calculation power of the, co of the computer. In case of the cloud, we have nearly unlimited calculation power. So here it's more a question of the latency for um, uh, show or uh, sending the data to the cloud and getting the output data back. But here is also something code moving. If you want to do this, um, then you, you, of course, uh, our my professional service team is here to help you to integrate this into your software. 
file encryption. In some use cases, uh, you might need to, or you might want to encrypt some data files, some configuration files, but also some uh, files which were created, for instance, uh, some record files. Um, if uh, you have a software which uh, records a concert and you want to store this, them, encrypt it, and only uh, read them with your own software, something like this. In this case, uh, you need some encryption of, of files, encryption, decryption of files, and there are two options. One option, you can use our CodeMeter Core API, which means you need to uh, be familiar with uh, which algorithm can I use, how to have petting and filling, something like this. So if the, uh, if the data size is less than 16 byte, uh, if the data size is not an, uh, an even number of 16 byte times or something like this, and how to fill and, and, and pet this. And so um, there are a few things to, to, to concern. And with our file encryption, we offer this out of the box so that we automatically encrypt and decrypt files that your application writes. But of course, also this has some, some limitations because when we say we want to encrypt and decrypt every uh, XML file, then of course, every file with the extension XML will be encrypted or decrypted. Uh, but if it is possible to um, copy this to the clipboard, then of course, um, the, the uh, encryption is broken. And so maybe using the API offers you a more granular option to uh, implement your, your features, but file encryption is very easy to use and available. And last but not least, the feature which is not available for the .NET AX protector, but just to explain it here, compile time obfuscation. This is a new feature that we offer for native Windows, Mac OS and Linux applications, mainly written in C, C++. So one requirement is using the Clang or the CLang uh, com compiler. And um, in this case, the obfuscation or the protection obfuscation is already done during the compile time. That's why we require the special compiler. And uh, this uh, offers another level of protection going even above the security that we reach with uh, the other automatic protection, modular licensing and so on. And this is a recommendation, especially if you want to use the IP protection where you don't have a secure license anchor for, for the key. In this case, the compile time obfuscation would be a good benefit, a good um, improvement of the security. But uh, currently, this is available for native C applications uh, only, and so not available for .NET. Speaking of .NET, AXProtector.NET, we have four variants that we, that we currently have available for you. Two of them will be also available on long term. Uh, the first one is axprotector.net uh, 10.30. This uh, 10.30 is still included in the installation package of the uh, AX protection suite 11.20 and will also be part of the, of the next installation package. So we still maintain axprotector.net 10.30. And the reason for this, this is the uh, last version which um, supports framework versions smaller than 4.7.2. Um, the reason for this is uh, there was a technology change uh, for Microsoft and we use this, uh, some of the, the new features with the new AX protector. But we know that even if this framework 472 and all the former frameworks are already out of support for Microsoft, we know that they are still are uh, used by, by our customers. And that's why we decided to um, keep it uh, under support and to um, still uh, maintain AX protector 1030 for this use cases. In the installation package, we currently have three current versions, axprotector.net, axprotector.net standard, and axprotector.net NC. NC is for native core, and in this case, uh, we need a native library, the CPSRT, CodeMeter Protection Suite Runtime Library, uh, which gives you a lot of, a lot of benefits, uh, two core benefits. And um, the other ones, the axprotector.net is for the framework applications, axprotector.net standard for .NET standard applications. The axprotector.net is the one which is currently integrated into the, uh, the graphical user interface. For the next release, it's planned to switch this to the native core already. And native core is now available since uh, the last two uh, releases. And this is def definitely the technology of the future that we will show all, also here today. Uh, it uh, supports .NET framework, it supports .NET standard, and also the unification versions like .NET 5, .NET 6, .NET 7. And so the native core is especially the best choice for the latest versions. 
it nearly includes all features that we have already the, the other versions. Um, currently, um, you need to create a configuration file manually, and then you can integrate this into your build system. So in most of the cases, it's not a big problem to create this, this configuration files because you want to do it on a build system. And in the next uh, version, as mentioned, we will also plan to have the support for the graphical user interface. I told you that there were two major benefits, advantages of the native core technology. And one of them is uh, due to this native library, we have a higher security level because native code is harder to disassemble and reverse engineer than .NET code. And the second benefit is we use the same uh, native component already also for JavaScript and for Python. And we plan to use the same native component for the other ones like Java, Android, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, and so on. And so um, instead of uh, having different error handlings, error messages, um, in all the all the versions, we have a unified error handling system. Uh, when uh, currently with .NET, uh, Python, and then JavaScript, and in the future with all the other ones as well. And so you need to implement the error handling only once, and can use it for all platforms and all your programs. Uh, and that you don't need to take care if this is a Python or JavaScript or .NET or native application. You can use the same library for error handling and messaging in all these cases. Yeah, maybe you may wonder, .NET itself is a platform independent language and here we introduce a native component. So you could ask yourself, what's with our platform independence now? But this is now something we tackled also because we yeah, deploy, as you know, for Windows, x x86 and x64. So this is something you already know and we provide the CPSRT for both. Um, flavors. But also for the Xpractor NC, we provide support for macOS x64 and for the new ARM technology, Rudiger mentioned before. And here you also get CPSRT versions which are compiled from us for this platform and which are contained in the CodeMeta installation package automatically. So you don't need to take care that you provide this to your customers when you use CodeMeta licensing. We also have support for Linux variants because this is now a popular platform also for server applications. And here we support mainly the desktop versions for 64-bit and 32-bit, also for ARM, as you see. And what you see here now is the basic platform targets we provide you as CPSRT. And for other environments like Docker, we also have something to show you. This was a, exactly my, my question, Axel. Uh, I heard that uh, Alpine, Linux Alpine, is the preferred platform for .NET developers. And uh, I heard something like, this is not a standard platform from our uh, point of view. Do we have something for Alpine? Yeah, you are exactly right. Alpine is provided by Microsoft also for the standard .NET runtime containers. And Alpine is very popular because it's a very slim package but it's based on a different standard library. It's not based on the glibc, it's based on the Musil library. And as you would have guessed, yeah, we also provide something for, for this. And these are separately licensable for x64, ARMHF, and ARC64. And these platforms you can yeah, get separately from us, and then you can also distribute it to your customers. Yeah, this was all for the for the targets. So as you see, platform independence is still relevant and you only encrypt the .NET assembly once and then you can distribute it everywhere. It only depends on the CPSRT if it's available or not. And if there is some platform in the future which is not listed here, then the chance is really high that an already encrypted .NET assembly also works on the new platform. This is also a a benefit from using the native code technology. So if there's something or some platform that you want to have or, or need to have and uh, it's not listed here, please feel free to contact your sales um, um, contact and then we can check together with our product management and with Excel uh, if this is possible. And I think we can make it possible uh, if you if you need this. Um, 
Let's talk about the basic principle of AXProtector.net. It's the same for all of them, so for the uh, 1030, for the NC and for the standard version and for the AXProtector.net of course uh, as well. Uh, this is your uh, compiled uh, assembly, so you don't need to take care about copy protection at all. And uh, the assembly includes some namespaces, um, methods uh, and classes, namespaces, classes, methods, methods in, in this um, order. And then you define firm code and product code, which defines the license. And then you encrypt the app uh, application, the uh, assembly, uh, with this firm code product code. But we don't encrypt it as a whole block. We cut out every single method. We encrypt every single method, and then we insert a single method into the protected application. And we also can encrypt uh, the resources. And of course, we need to add the security engine. So this is a piece of our code, which then will call the CPSRT library, so this native library, and uh, uh, let the CPSRT library do the decryption of the encrypted methods. So let's check um, what happens on the ISV side. So on the, on the vendor side, like mentioned, the namespaces get extracted, classes, methods, and then they execute the code. Uh, we um, create a new assembly with the same name. We uh, create methods, namespaces uh, in the same way. Uh, we encrypt your individual code. We encrypt the individual, individual code, write it back, include some additional information for the decryption. Additionally, we can encrypt the resources. We insert some automatic security checks. We will see this in the configuration from Axel. And of course, due to the fact that we don't change the names, uh, reflection, remoting, and uh, other things are still possible. Except? Yeah, except if you use the newly introduced name obfuscation, which is now available for 1120X protector NC. And you may ask yourself, didn't I read this feature in the previous X protector 1030? And yes, we had something like this before, but due to technology changes, this wasn't available for the current ice protector. But now you get this feature back and even more, you can also use now a string encryption feature which protects the strings in your assembly. And also you have now namespace obfuscation feature, so-called namespace flattening. So we put all classes in one combined namespace so that an attacker doesn't get any clue from namespace names. And this is a feature which may break in combination with also the normal name obfuscation, the yeah the working of reflection. So you have to decide which feature you want to use or which features your application currently uses from .NET, and if name obfuscation is possible. To make it a little bit more accessible to you, we have a, an additional parameter for the name obfuscation, which is the scope. So currently we only obfuscate in default private and in members and members with the inherit scope. So most of the yeah, reflection stuff shouldn't break, but you can also decide if you want to obfuscate members which are of protected scope or of public scope. And these, yeah, if, if a member is public, then it's kind of an interface symbol and it's high or very likely that some other component may call it and if you then make obfuscation then it can lead to yeah, an undefined behavior let's say so this is something when you have the full control over your system then you also have the power to obfuscate all things and make it working correctly but we give you the choice how you use these features which we provide you um, I guess um, that there's also an attribute with which I can um, already define this in my code. And uh, what is if I'm using the Microsoft obfuscation attribute? Yeah, since we don't really know the intent Microsoft had with the obfuscation attribute, we introduced our attributes and we simply print you a warning when there is a Microsoft attribute that you should take care of this and place something from us above because then we know what we introduce we have to control over it if microsoft does something in future with .net 
but with the obfuscation attribute, then it would or it could break with our techniques. So we warn you if you use this. Yeah, and now let's take a look at the user side and the decryption during runtime. And so, um, as mentioned before, we don't uh, encrypt it as a block. So we encrypt every method. And when a method is called for the first time, the code gets uh, decrypted automatically. But of course, only if a fitting suitable license is available. And so this is what we call the on-demand decryption of the executable code. The decrypted code is removed I would say nearly immediately uh, from the memory. And uh, Axel can explain this, I think, a little bit more in detail. Yeah, since we operate in the middle of the .NET framework, let's say, we have also more control when the IL code is decrypted and handed over to the .NET framework as before. And in this case, we decrypt the code, pass it to the .NET framework, and when the .NET framework comes back, we immediately delete it from the memory. So an attacker, has a very, very short time slot to get the plain IL code and also has a hard time to even analyze all the stuff to get into the layer where we yeah, process the IL code. So a simple sampling from the outside isn't something of a success because then an attacker would, would need to be very lucky to have the have selected the correct time slot to get the IL code. And what is now in the memory when you take a snapshot is only the encrypted code and the lowered machine level code because the normal IL code cannot be executed by the CPU. It needs to be translated into an understandable form into machine code. And this is only there. And to reverse machine code to readable source code is a very hard problem and there's no generic approach currently available to get the same results as lifting it from IL code. And as mentioned before, with this um, new um, CPSRT, we also introduced a new CPS events interface uh, that you can use for flexible error handling or even for, for messages. It does, doesn't need to be an error. Also, you can uh, select which license should be, uh, should be uh, used and chosen. So especially if um, you have an application, application starts and there are multiple licenses for the application available, you can decide if it should be chosen from server one or server two. And if there are the similar licenses, which one of them should be chosen. So this is a way not only to um, introduce the error handling, but also to um, modify the behavior of your protected application. Yeah, and if you have currently already a native user message DLL, which was the formal name of this error handling, then you can also use it now with the CPS events in combination because we provide a wrapper that you can use both. But we recommend that you write an, a new CPS events library when you have custom actions because you have lots of options to do as Rudiger mentioned. So you have more fine-grained control and also you have better interoperation with other yeah, protection schemes we provide. So it's recommended to yeah, have a look at the new CPS events. Yeah, so the end you have three different options. You can provide or you can take the sample that we provide, the standard implementation that we provide. You can take the header file and implement your own implementation. Or uh, if you want us to do this, my professional service team is here and uh, can help you to implement your own CPS event events. So if you want to have this, uh, you need to write down your requirements and then our sales team can create an offer for an individual adapted CPS events uh, library if you want to have this. Axel, how does the code look like or does it not look like um, when we take a look like um, Eel doesn't or like dot peak or in this case uh, just decompile to take a look at the code. Definitely it looks different. This is what I can tell you. And it's visible that we don't see any code anymore. And also we don't see any names of functions and members. And this is what the exprotector.net does. It tries to hide all the information and it's also not recoverable. It's, it's really gone. And 
In case of just decompile, as you see, it also crashes the decompilation engine. So since we inject special fragments into the binary, it's not able to process this since it doesn't really know what it means. And also the, the protected form of all this, of all your IP is not in the same location. So it's not something the tools yeah, can process. So the application is protected in a very good manner to not being able to recover. Yeah. Um... Modular protection of a single assembly. So what we have seen um, was the protection of one assembly with one license. But what if I want to use different licenses, let's say our freemium uh, version, uh, where we only want to activate a few features with the license. And in this case, uh, we have the same compiled assembly. I can click here. And instead of giving one film code product code, we define a list of film code product codes. And we need to define which function with, with which method uh, should be encrypted with this firm code, brother code combination. Our uh, best practice recommendation is to uh, do this assignment already with an attribute in the code. Uh, but of course, you can also do this in the, in the configuration file. So both options are available. But I think recommended best, best case best practice is to do this already in the code to make it more reliable. And then what does AX Protector do? It encrypts um, the software using different licenses to so different firm code brother code combinations. So maybe the turquoise one for one and uh, the blue one for another one. And what we also see here, we can um, keep some special functions unencrypted. In the past, this was needed uh, to um, uh, think about some performance issues uh, with the current uh, native core technology. We will see later in a comparison that it is not really needed any, any longer. Yeah, and uh, this is how it works. And uh, Axel, the floor is yours for a demonstration. Time to shine. Ah. So let's let's do this. So we prepared a little demo in the Windows environment. And the first challenge is to open the Windows Explorer. Okay. And the demo should be familiar to you if you used the examples before since I prepared the sample notepad application. The legendary sample yeah, notepad. It's really a beautiful one. And I'm having a good time finding a text here. And I know the sample notepad has a very special special feature, which only sample notepad provides you. you can change the font of the written text. And I choose this and I say, yeah, this is this is good. And this is the main feature of Sample Notepad. And I think it's worthy to license this feature. Changing fonts of text is so awesome new that we can sell this to everyone. Yeah, I think we can get $1 per month for this. So de definitely. So uh, at, we, at we, least. So we, sh we should protect this. And uh, what uh, do we need to do in the code? Yeah, first you see it's a .NET 6.0 application. So it's recent technology. And how do we do this? I think I opened the solution that you see a little bit better how we employ the protection. And as Rudiger mentioned before, we show you here the recommended way. And this is by attributing the functions which are relevant for changing the font. And here you see change font is our function which spawns the dialogue for the font selection and here we simply say licensing and license list equals one. This means that this function should be bound to the license list one. And if you're familiar with the license list concept, then you know you can later on choose licenses for this license list. Can I also put a, uh, this license list flag to a complete class or do I need to put it to every single uh, function? You can also specify this for the complete class. Okay, so if you I have it, classes for functionalities, uh, this is also a very best practice approach. Uh, even if you have classes and classes, you can define it for the parent class and then it's all already inherited from the, from the subclass, uh, from the contained class, let's say. 
subclass needs to have uh, a different one if we have an inheritance relationship. Mm -hmm. What you can also do and what you should do is to also embed traps into your code. And traps are a very powerful feature to make it nearly impossible for an attacker to be able to decrypt the whole program by simply decrypting every function with a single license. Because what's the background of it? Here we have a different function which looks kind of identical because it's also impossible that it, the, the traps are not semantically different or synthetically different for an attacker to see. We attribute or we place the attribute trap equals true as a protection flag. And this tells the X protector to create a special sequence which on decryption blocks the license. And after a license is locked, it cannot be used for further decryption. Now it's important to also reference this function. Because if an attacker has any clue that a function is not used in the assembly, he could guess if it's not used, then it's that code, and that code is not relevant, so I don't try to decrypt it. And here you should use your domain knowledge and reference functions in conditions which cannot evaluate to true. We call these conditions opaque predicates. And one opaque predicate, for example, is if you have a font size less than equal, then this doesn't make sense at all because then it wouldn't be displayed. Yeah, another, another sample could be that uh, the tax rate on your uh, income is more than 100%, which is also unlikely or not possible. Or if you have a civil engineering software that an ankle is uh, bigger than 19 degree or something like this. So really some knowledge that you have, but the compiler does not have this knowledge. And of course, the attacker also doesn't have this knowledge. Yeah, and it's even more harder for an attacker to guess knowledge when the names are obfuscated. So then he really tries to decrypt all and then it's very likely that he will raise the trap. But we are now talking about not raising the trap. This is, here's your change font function. And we also placed a check license call before. And this is a best practice we give to our customers to make a license check for the respective license list to get better control over the existence of a license and also have a better integration into the software. Because here I can say, if a license is not there, I can deactivate the, the change font button or something like, like this. And here we simply use it to show a message box if a license is not there. For sure, you can also rely on the CPS events to display you an arrow or an, a message to react on this. But in many cases, our customers like the feature to do silent checks because the Whoopi check license won't trigger in default case a message box through the CPS events. I mean, you get notified through CPS events, but you also get a flag that this is a Whoopi call and then you can suppress the error. And here, we simply say, if the license is not there, then don't even try to call the function because it cannot work. And so it's more a strategic decision uh, of your product management. Um, what do of you, uh, what, what, what you want to do? If you want to hide a function, disable a function, or even look like it is enabled, and then when you click on it, uh, bringing the message, you need to buy this function, please go to our online shop, e-commerce system, and here you can buy it for one, $1 per year. Uh, and something like this. So this is more strategic, uh, strategic question. And uh, as Axel mentioned, here you can check if the license is there and then you can handle in the way you want to do this. Right, so I think we saw enough from the integration in the code. Let's look how we actually protect the application with the xcollector.net and see. And first of all, we also need to look at the configuration file, the Vibu CPS conf. And here we have several options. And if you are already using the Xvector Python or JavaScript, you should be familiar with what you see here. At first, we specify options for protecting the application. This is, we want a runtime check, which per periodically 
checks for, for debugger, in this case, every 30 seconds. And we also enabled obfuscation, in this case, the name obfuscation. And as I told you before, there are also several options for .NET assemblies, like namespace, threatening, or defining the scope of the name obfuscation, which are then visible in the .NET options, which you can place below. Also, we need to specify our licenses, which should be used during runtime. And here we have two licenses because we want a freemium. We want to use the sample notepad without a license in its normal form, but the change font should be licensed. So we define an IP protection license and we define a code meta license. Now these licenses need to be referenced in license lists. And license list zero is always the license for protecting the whole application. This is a, a, sh a shortcut, let's say, that you don't need to specify it. It's simply there when you have license list zero. So for this, we use the IP protection license, which is not bound to any code meter license. And the license list one, which you remember we specified for the change font function, is bound to the license CM. Now we have also a protection set section, which optionally let you specify protection options in the Vibu CPS comms if you don't use annotations in your code. So this is not needed. It's optional there only to show you that you can also do it from the configuration file. And CPS events means you want to have the basic CPS events library for messaging. So let's look how the application is protected. We have our, I prepared little protect CMD, but the most relevant call is this one. .NET for yeah, the .NET engine. Then we have our AX protector NC, which resides in AX protector SDK, bin .NET NC, and then AX protector .dll. Then we need to pass our protection configuration, the protect people psconf I showed you right before. And optionally, you also can pass the input file and the output here as a third and fourth parameter. But you can also define this. These two parameters in the CPS conf, we only have it here to show you the possibility of what it's yeah, possible with the X protector command line. Then I prepared something that the, the protection target is copied into a new folder and also the CPS events is copied from the SDK to the target output folder. But now let's run the protect command and see what's done. So it's running through. And I quickly also show you a little bit what's displayed. At first, it tells you what core protection features you are using. In this case, we have the basic protection, for sure, because we want to protect the whole application. Then we have the modular protection because we use the licenses one. And also IP protection, since our freemium isn't bound to any license. It displays us what .NET framework is used, also some yeah, informations which functions were encrypted and which are not because they were too small. Too small means less than 10 byte. And also we have some statistics, how many functions were encrypted and which were not encrypted due to exclusion or an attribute which prevented it from encryption in this case too small. I guess the small is a fixed size of 10, so there's yeah, it's, it's it, nothing that we can that you can change. It's fixed size because um, fixed size since less than 10 doesn't mean to us it has any IP which is relevant. Yeah, makes sense. So let's look in the protected folder and here we have our sample notepad exe and DL. So we started and we see it's working. So I And now we try to change the font. And now our license error is triggered. And this is because I don't have the license available. So let's program the license. So usually, of course, this is done with license center. Uh, so you create a ticket, you send the ticket to the user. In this case, Axel has a, is a developer and he does this for testing purposes with his firm security box on his local computer. 
and now the license is there and it should work really cool so now we have our i think the we have a cool font here if i find it elephant the elephant and make it big I make an it, elephant i make it big make it really big i make it really big great this is, like elephant. This is some elephant Thanks. big text great so this is working as expected and i think this should be all for now for the little sample application let's head back to our presentation Yeah, so what have we seen? We have seen that uh, we're using different uh, license lists for uh, high security. So we encrypt um, the different features, functions, methods with different uh, effective keys um, for the encryption of the code. We um, recommendation do a markup with an attribute in the code, uh, or we configure this in the YAML file. So typically only the license list in the YAML file and the rest in the attribute in the application itself. And Axel showed you that the application behavior can be controlled by Whoopi calls with the Vivo Universal Protection Interface, which is a high level API for easy integration. So you don't need to take care about the core API getting a handle doing this. You simply say check license and we do the rest in the background for you. And um, in this case, if you do the Whoopi calls, no AX engine or CPS events messages are shown. And um, I still say you need both. So because with the Whoopi API, you could make the behavior and you get a security with the encryption with the different license lists. And if you have both, you have the good user experience plus the high security. That's why you need the encryption and the API calls. Here we see it, uh, just a sample, similar sample that Axel showed you. Uh, difference is here I didn't you uh, wrote using Whoopi Engine. That's why I need to write Whoopi Engine dot Whoopi instead of only Whoopi dot check license. <coughs> the, the same code is less less uh, less complex code, and the attribute on the function itself changes the font. Um, and in the AX Protect GUI, we saw that um, the change font uh, is uh, attributed with license list one. There is an alternative approach in error handling, which means exception handling. So instead of uh, calling um, um, Ruby check license before, you simply put your protected code into a try catch block. And um, then you catch an exception. If the exception is a Whoopi engine, Whoopi exception, then you know the license is not there and then you can uh, react. Um, the difference is that in this case, the CPS event gets fired and you get a message box or an error is, is, is recorded somewhere. And so um, the difference is if the CPS event is fired or if it is not uh, triggered. Uh, so for the Whoopi check, it's not triggered. For the exception handling, it is triggered. But in both cases, you can still uh, say it should not uh, show a message or it should show a message. So you are completely flexible. And um, we recommend also a global try catch around the entry point uh, to uh, yeah, catch any global licensing exceptions. Right, because even if you call Whoopi check license, then you know the license is there from the, from the point where you called the check, but afterwards it can also go stale or stale because yeah, someone can unplug the dongle or something and then you should also handle this event properly. Fine-tuning performance. Uh, when I started a um, long time ago, 20 years now, I think, uh, for Vivo Systems, um, and we have AX Protector now since 15 years, AXProtector.net, so a long time and um, a lot of uh, generations and improvements in this time. Uh, Fine-tuning was a hot topic at the beginning. And uh, if you take a look at uh, the current performance um, uh, measurements uh, that we made with some sample application, you see it's no longer really a topic. So the unprotected application for 1 billion times calling uh, one function uh, took 36 seconds. The one protected with xprotector.net um, 37 and the one with xprotector.net NC is very close to the unprotected application. And so to see this in a uh, um, better scale, here we have only from 35 to 38 seconds 
And what we see is that um, the unprotected LNC has nearly this, the same performance and the performance loss of an AX protector protected application is around 2%. Uh, percent. And if we speak of the AXProtector.net NC is less than 0.2%. Uh, percent. Uh, and to, uh, when we made this, this measurement uh, this morning, um, we found out that in some cases the AXProtector.net NC protected application is even faster than the un unprotected one. So I think here we reached the border of, the, of our measuring system. And uh, so I would say the performance loss is nearly not countable in case of the AXProtector.net NC. And this is also why Rüdiger told you before on the, the schematic where there were functions which were excluded from the encryption in the previous versions of AXProtector.net. This is now not the case anymore that you need to exclude functions due to performance reasons because the AXProtector.net NC scales automatically during runtime and should give you the best possible performance for your current usage. Last but not least, before we come to a final demonstration is um, modular protection of multiple assemblies. So um, currently we said, hey, we have one executable and uh, that's it. But uh, of course, in the real world, um, yeah, you typically have a lot of executables or a lot of libraries. And if you say, okay, all of them should use same firm code product code, then it's fine, it's great. But uh, let's assume that you have um, functions that you want to separate uh, differently, separately. And the best practice approach is to say, oh, I put uh, one feature in one assembly and have uh, and encrypt them as a single assembly with the same options that we have seen before. Uh, so one license, one assembly, one product code. And of course you can mix uh, protected and unprotected assemblies. Uh, this is of course possible. And for the error handling, we have three options. We have the option that the uh, um, Entry point is not encrypted in the library. The executable calls this entry point. The library checks with Whoopi check license, same like in the single assembly um, case, if the license is available. And if yes, it continues. And if no, it uh, will bring an error message, error handling, uh, which is um, the error handling which the executable understands. Or the library raises the Whoopi exception and the executable is catching the Whoopi exception. Or last but not least, the executable knows uh, which license is needed for the library and doesn't load the library uh, if the license is not there. So and these are the options that you have, but the uh, um, implementation is very similar to the single assembly solution. The second use case, uh, which is uh, often used uh, for music software or for um, plugins for um, uh, CAD uh, software, uh, someone is, uh, is offering a host application, and another vendor, you, are creating a plugin for this host uh, uh, for this host operation. And so we're having plugins with an individual firm called product code. So maybe the host is encrypted with CodeMeter from another vendor. Maybe it's encrypted with something else. Maybe it's not encrypted. Maybe no, it has uh, some some special things in. And so mixing of different firm codes is uh, possible. Even mixing with other copy protection systems is, is possible. Uh, mixing with other licensing vendors is possible. And in this case, the error handling should be in the plugin. So the error handling should be in the entry point, so unencrypted entry point. So the second option that we had in the in your own uh, implementation. And uh, then, of course, um, you, ch you check in your plugin if the license is there. And if the license is not there, you uh, deliver the error, which is defined by the um, vendor of the host application. What should be done if your plugin cannot perform the operation? And I think there is also some additional option that I should yeah. add, Axel. The normal operation mode is that when we detect any Tambo event, that we try to shut down the whole process. But if you recap in a host plugin environment, we are only a, a, maybe a little part of the whole environment, and then you won't be the root cause if a whole project dies due to an anti-debug event. And for this, there's an option that you throw or that our system throws an, an exception instead 
of terminating the whole application. And since we are thinking always a little bit different, it's not called exception instead of termination, it's called exception on termination. And this is what you set then in the options. And then the, the copy protection engine only throws this exception during an event and does not shut down the whole process. And this is especially relevant for plugins. Cool. Last but not least, uh, at the beginning, uh, we told you that we have multi um, targets uh, available and um, Axel prepared a, de a small demonstration which uses nearly everything. It uses code moving, it uses dongles, it uses a cloud container, it runs under Windows, it runs under macOS, and it also runs under Alpine in the Docker environment. Axel. The floor yeah. is completely yours. Yeah. And it's performing a Fibonacci calculation. I think it cannot be more complex. So let's see how this is done. We start again in our famous Windows environment. And we have our code moving program now. So let me quickly show you what this program does. It's basically, as I said before, a Fibonacci calculation. And the core of this calculation is done in this function. As you see, it doesn't really look like a Fibonacci calculation. And this is because we want to move this calculation inside the CM container. In this case, we call the execution via whoopee execute move code. And we have two parameters, the number and the result, which is passed via structures. So now let's look at the code moving program. I only give you a, a quick peek. And this is the Fibonacci function, which looks indeed more like Fibonacci. And this is the iterative form, not the recursive one. It simply calculates the element and then returns it. So let me at first show you how this is working normally. So we go into our bin folder. It's also a .NET 6 application. And now let's run it. We have our perform Fibonacci and I say I want to calculate Fibonacci of 10 and the result is 55. Let's try another one. Four is three. And really, do you have a number? Yeah, let's try the 22. I just looked in Wikipedia. It would be 17711. Great. So it's uh, calculated indeed, correctly. It's indeed working. So I think this should tell you that it's working correctly. And what you saw now, we didn't really execute the code in the .NET program, even if it's not encrypted. It's already executing the code, which is written in the C file, but it's simulated in the background on your host machine. And this is something which enables you also to debug programs written in the code moving block because when you want to have something during development and want to yeah, trace some error in your algorithm then you are able to use the simulation to debug also code moving code do i already need a license to do the simulation it should run without a license okay but you for a special simulation mode, you need to have the CM dongle like simulation license, which is which gives you some better insight if how it's performing inside a dongle, and therefore you need a special license. So let's protect the application. I already did this, and it's in the protect do folder, and I execute it here. Code moving DLL. And now I get license is not found. And this is what we expected because when your license is there, I want to have the application not to start. And as Rüdiger mentioned before, we, use a cloud we are going all in today and using an already prepared cloud container. It's accessed by simply drag and dropping the credentials file. Now we start 
to Copenhagen again. And now we see it's working. And I take a shortcut. I simply type in the 22. And what's done now, it calculates the Fibonacci of the number 22 in our uh, computer center in Frankfurt. So this is something mind-blowing, I think. And um, let's also take a different one. I hope. I think this one is also correct. One one three four nine zero oh, three one seven zero. Oh. Yeah, was it correct? Yes, this seems correct. So you saw, Copenhagen is working correctly in Windows with CM Cloud. But does, does the same application also work on your Mac? This is something I want to show you now, and you you should believe me that I show you now. Since I rooted the folder inside the VM, so I can simply open the folder also on Mac. And I type .NET code moving PLL. It's already protected. And now we get the same. And yeah, I make 22. And as we know, 17711. Yeah, and if you have an installed code meter runtime or code meter SDK on this machine, then the CPSRT library is already installed for your platform, and so it's already there. Yeah. And uh, this um, um, CM Cloud license yeah. is also there. Yeah. And um, so um, the program already detects the uh, fitting CPSRT version, DLL shared object, and, and is using it. Okay, so now let's head to the other case. We want to execute it inside the Docker environment. And here I have a recent.NET 6 Alpine image. And I start this, I go into the folder. And I get in this case, we need to copy the shared object, the CPSRT manually, correct? This is right. And it's a good pointer because for Alpine, we don't have a code meter runtime. Here we use the embedded driver, but communicate over network with the code meter server in the host application and the host runtime. So or in a different container, which right. is not an Alpine container, but um, yeah. This is something you can then root via network stuff. But now I copy the CPSRT, which is in this case the Moosel x64 CPSRT mm -hmm. inside the folder. And now I try to start it. I need to write the real name with and now I get a license error and the segmentation fault is by intention because the program tries to execute not decrypted code. So what did I miss? Yeah, for, for this scenario, I also need to specify that code meter should use the host Docker internal interface as a communication channel with the host code meter server. So when I set this and I execute the application again, now it opens and I type in 22 and we see also this works as expected. So if you are more interested in the Docker environment, there was a keynote article about this uh, explaining the um, uh, Docker requirement, like setting up the Docker network so that um, the code meter runtime is either on the host or in one special Docker container and how to set up the communication. This is exactly what Axel uh, did here in this case. And so if you're interested in this, there's a keynote article that you can read online on our website. Right. So I think this was all for now. And I switch back to the presentation. And do we have some questions? Uh, yes, I already saw some questions. Let me go back to the questions, give me a second. Now I have the right window open. Um, is there a NuGet package for the libraries that uh, you need uh, when you do this? With library, you, uh, I think it, it's meant that's the Whoopi engine, which is needed to call the Whoopi functions. And there we, we don't provide a NuGet package because the Whoopi engine itself is a .NET standard library, which can simply uh, yeah, include it as a reference. And then it's platform independent available for a .NET project. And we, we don't see any need to uh, yeah, provide a NuGet package for this. 
okay, if I'm setting an attribute and I'm setting the same uh, uh, function in the in the configuration file, uh, which one is used? So especially, I guess, if uh, I'm setting two different values, so let's say in the attributes license is one and in the uh, configuration file license is two, what is used, one, two or three? All I can say is the code is the source of truth. So this one has the highest priority, but when you want that the CPS or Vibu CPS conf has a higher priority priority than the code, then you can pass an override a value to the protection setting, and then the Vibu CPS conf value is used. So if I can quickly show it to you in the in the sample configuration. So let's say we go into protect, and then I say here, I want to really not encrypt, encrypt this. Then I say override true, and then it has the highest priority and will also be used even if an attribute is stated in the code. Okay. Which license is needed for the AXProtector.NET NC? I think I can answer this question. So there's one license um, for the AXProtector.NET. And with this one license, you can um, execute um, either xprotector.net uh, 1030, the xprotector.net, xprotector.net standard, and uh, xprotector.net NC. So there's one license, and you can uh, decide yourself which of the xprotector variants.net you want to use. Uh, do I still need xprotector.net uh, 1030 for framework uh, smaller than 472? What happens uh, if I'm using an older framework application with the latest xprotector? And then the latest xprotector will throw an error message that the assembly is too old and that you should use the 730 for it if you want to encrypt it because this xprotector is provided for all the legacy.net versions and then you should use this. Is there CPS events for non-graphical user interface program? The CPS events the, in its default mode message you via the via command line standard out. And if you use the user message DLL in, in combination, then it's up to you how you handle it. The default mode has a graphical user interface, the default user message but in normal mode, when you don't use it, then you have only standard output text. And the last one, the last question that I have here, um, and this is one, I guess this is a uh, already user of, of, of AX Protector. Uh, is there also an automatic web creation for AX Protector NC? All I can say is trap generation true. And then it's automatically Generated. So what Excel wants to say, yes, it is, and you <laughs> need to enter this trap generation true into the configuration <laughs> file, into the YAML file. Right. I see there are no additional questions, so I would like to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for listening to us, um, and I hope you got some useful information for the protection of your .NET uh, application. Uh, thank you from my side once again, and uh, have a nice evening, have a nice day, bye-bye. Also from my end, have a good day. Thank you for being here and bye-bye until next time.